The Osiris shaft, same as pyramids, both seem to be very ancient relics of some civilization that we somehow can't identify. The recent dating results from this shaft with a novel method challenge the basis of the entire chronology of the Giza Plateau. The shaft is 35 meters down, within a bedrock, beneath the surface. At the bottom, is so-called the Tomb of Osiris, a secret subterranean structure with a granite sarcophagus, lying in the center of a chamber, surrounded by an artificial canal filled with water. And to make things more intriguing still, one of the Osiris shaft sarcophagus is made of an anomalous material, otherwise unknown to Egyptology. The stone, which was never used for any other stone object in the entire history of ancient Egypt. So the mystery deepens. The Osiris Shaft is the name used to designate a deep underground structure that is situated directly beneath the long limestone causeway towards the Sphinx, which is known as Chephren Causeway at Giza. The interesting thing about it is how enormously deep and ancient it is. This structure itself very much resembles our modern underground repositories, and in fact, it may be older than the pyramids themselves, before the name Osiris was even in use. The Osiris name is attached to it because of the design of its level 3 that resembles the replica of the mythical tomb of Osiris, which is described as a stone sarcophagus on an island surrounded with water from which Osiris rose from the dead. There are some odd things there that we get used to taking for granted. Like this shaft was not adapted to constant access to its content. There are no ladders or any other means to get down easily. The ladders that are present now were installed by archaeologists. Another thing is that for some odd reason, its builders decided to bring massive granite boxes underground rather than hatch burial places right in the bedrock. Bringing in just lids for that purpose would make their task much easier. The sarcophagi were done from the different stone material than the shaft itself and without any inscriptions left on them making us conclude that it served some genuine purpose that we still don't quite understand. The shaft itself hacked out of the solid bedrock and contains no stonework of any kind, so it cannot be dated. The direct stone dating method of some giant sarcophagi from this bizarre place showed that these are very ancient and one of them was made of a stone of the most puzzling type. Five of the seven sarcophagi in the second level vanished and only the two gigantic ones remain. On some rough estimation, they must weigh up to 40 tons apiece. How these huge weighty objects were lowered by rope and kept steady is a challenge to the imagination. Was it done with the help of the water in the shaft somehow? If any mistake on the stage of lowering them down, the 40-ton sarcophagus would block the entrance to the entire shaft for good. But the builders were pretty confident they could do it. In a niche on the south wall of level 2 is a gigantic black stone sarcophagus, which we will call Sarcophagus 1. The surface of this sarcophagus is covered with some kind of thin film of bitum, and there is something interesting right beneath it. Here is that bitum crust, and underneath it there is something white illuminated. White color means heavy elements, such as metals. So it is obvious that underneath the bitum it is covered with a metallic coating. What is this coating? The main element is lead with some minor amount of zinc, ferrum, titanium and arsenic. By the type of these metallic traces, one can conclude that it seems like the stone surface was painted over. But this metallic coating might be used for some other purposes, rather than white color inside the sarcophagus. We will return to this thought in a moment. Unfortunately, the other team that was working on a direct stone dating project was not able to get the sample from this one. But they took a sample from the other giant sarcophagus on the same level. Sarcophagus 2 is in the end niche on the north wall, its gray color, and is certainly the object that is of greatest interest in the entire Osiris shaft. The first strange thing we discovered from the sample, by x-ray diffraction analysis, we were able to discover what mineral this was. The mineral was called dacite, and it doesn't occur in any other context in any artifact known from the entire history of ancient Egypt, only in this one sarcophagus. 
And I discussed that site with a geologist who had spent his life exploring the whole continent of Africa and, and had lived for many, many years as a geologist in Egypt. And he told me there are no dacite deposits in the whole continent of Africa that would yield a vein big enough to produce a sarcophagus of this size. What that means is that this strange sarcophagus is not from Egypt and had come from outside of the continent of Africa, probably shipped by sea from the other side of the Mediterranean, and it was either brought from Europe or somewhere from the Black Sea. To establish exact location, one should thoroughly investigate dacite deposits. There is no mention of its material in the ancient Egyptian materials and industries, nor in the ancient Egyptian stone vessels, which contains all the stones and minerals known from ancient Egyptian use. Dacite is igneous rock, largely composed of feldspar and quartz, with the crystals so small, they can only be identified with microscope, giving the rock a dull luster. The actual locations where some dacite veins are known to exist are all hundreds of miles from Osiris' shaft. Assuming that you located a vein large enough to produce sarcophagus, you would then find yourself an immensely long distance from Giza, not connected by a water route, faced with a necessity of enormous expenses of desert crossings, and all with a block weighing more than 40 tons to carry. So the questions certainly arise. How did they do it and why bother? Why didn't they just get some granite from a swan or some basalt from Fayum? Why go to this incredible amount of trouble? And if they found a way to do it this once, as they obviously had, why didn't they never do it again, for the whole of Egyptian history? The discovery of Dacite was only the first surprise with this sarcophagus. Later, researchers get the dating result for it. Dating range for the sarcophagus too extends way back to pre-dynastic times, to 3350 BC. That is about 850 years earlier than the generally accepted date for the construction of the Giza pyramids. At the very latest, it was the Old Kingdom, but it could be nearly a millennium older than the time of Cheops and the Fourth Dynasty. The key to these results was the new technique that can help to calculate the date of the last exposure to light of two pieces of stone which have been pressed together. This is the direct carved rock dating method of ancient monuments and artifacts made of granite, basalt and sandstone, now possible by Laritzus's optical thermoluminescence method. The way it works is this. Imagine the granite block before being cut and then carved to fit into a wall. And then imagine a tiny crystal of granite in it. A crystal absorbs a lot of free electrons from the surrounding radiation of its environment. It had been forced to swallow lots of electrons, which had been squeezed into microscopic holes in the crystal called electron traps. But then, this crystal was ripped from the womb of his granite rock and exposed, naked to the sun. The energy from the sunlight caused all of the electrons to start rushing out of their electron traps. Within only a few hours, the crystal was stripped bare of all of its electrons, and all its traps were empty. Then suddenly darkness descended, and the crystal was squeezed against another block of granite, and it never saw the sun again. Slowly, gradually, the electrons returned and began to fill in all the holes once more. But it took a long, long time. Professor Ionis Laritzis called the flooding of the granite crystal with sunlight, bleaching, and the emptying of its electron traps could be considered as setting a stone clock to zero. Then when a crystal is covered with darkness again, and electrons start creeping in as normal from ambient radiation, the crystal's clock starts ticking afresh. And if one removed the crystal again, not exposing it to the light, and counted the electrons which were in it, one could know how many years had elapsed since it had been bleached by the sun and this would give a date. But there is one thing that should be addressed. The date obtained from the thermoluminescence method actually determines not the date of manufacture of the artifact, but the date of its last heating to a high temperature. And it could have been either a fire or a long stay of the object in an open place under the sun before it was buried. It means that in fact, it can actually be much, much older. Apart from age and exotic stone material, there was another surprise with the sarcophagi on the level too. Here is what Professor Robert Temple wrote, quote, We took Geiger readings inside the two sarcophagi in level 2, and were astonished at the intense radioactivity given off by the stone, concentrating in the interiors of the sarcophagi. 
The gamma ray reading was double inside sarcophagus to than outside. He noted that these are so powerfully radioactive, that a corpse placed inside, would be so intensely irradiated that almost all of the decay bacteria in the organic material, would have been killed off. Certainly, he concludes, this helped to preserve the ancient mummies even more than the embalming process itself. Could be something, that ancient Egyptians noticed, and reused these, quote, magic boxes for. And the lead coating inside sarcophagi then, somehow be related to the genuine use, considering the high radiation readings inside. As the lead is widely used as a barrier, to protect from radiation today. We don't know. What we know, is that the grey sarcophagus which is found on level 3 is not of dacite. Mineralogical analysis revealed it is granite. Well, we have dated this sarcophagus. The earliest possible date, because of the spread in our results, would be 2370 BC. So, this sarcophagus is much newer than the one on level 2. And this has led me to believe that level 3 was added later to this shaft, and was not original. I'm inclined to favor the Middle Kingdom as more likely. That coincides precisely with when Osiris came to prominence in Egyptian religion. From the description of the shaft from the 19th century, it is clear that the four square pillars were intact on level 3, and the water level was only 10 to 15 centimeters above the main floor. Now here is um, a, a, another view of the canal. How did they know we're talking about 117 feet below the surface. How did they know that by cutting this, this meticulously shaped canal around this artificial island that they would have water available to fill the canal? Where does the water come from? And how does it come to just the right level? This is very interesting. Um, there's only one way that could have been done. There must be another si um, system of chambers and tunnels nearby where they were able to harness and direct a spring and there must be a conduit under the water level leading the water in to this canal. If anyone wanted to disguise a connecting passage, hiding it underwater would be a perfect way to go about it. At the Assyrian in Abydos, we know for certain that there is a constructed conduit opening beneath water level into the canal around the island which leads the water in. If there is an opening beneath water level leading into the canal around one Osiris Island, why should there not be one in the other? There is a serious possibility that the water comes from a constructed channel, concealed underwater, because the bedrock down there is just too solid for random leaks. If such a channel exists, then its construction must have been a mammoth subterranean undertaking, of the most furtive kind imaginable, since there must then be other chambers very near, in which the water was found, and a truly extraordinary plan must have been required. So this shaft could be a key to those, who were at Giza way before the first pharaohs. I'm just mentioning that the bottom level is younger than level 2, and I think it was an extension at a later time but that the, the, the main shaft is um, no later than Old Kingdom, but I believe uh, pre-dynastic. But the sarcophagus too, being made of a unique stone, that to the best of our knowledge, occurs nowhere else. It is now amongst the surviving remains from the dawn of the ancient Egyptian civilization, and must now be seen as one of the oldest of all carved objects to survive in the whole of Egypt. The location of the Osiris shaft seems to be firmly embedded into Giza design scheme from the beginning as well. And its positioning suggests that it dates back to the time when the Giza plans were still understood. It could be an integral part of it from the very beginning.